Good morning again. It's still Thursday, uh, the 17th of, um, of October, and uh, this is uh, a video about Chapter 7 of Healy. And um, here we're talking, the chapter is called Estimation Procedures. Now, um, it's an important concept to think about. Um, if you remember from what we've been talking about, uh, we're trying to estimate this parameter. And we're using this pathway in order to accomplish that because this is too expensive both in time, personnel, and costs uh, to get a parameter from a, a population of a million, an age, let's say the age, or even what proportion are female, let's say. Uh, we'd have to look at all million people in order to determine that. So um, we draw down a random sample by one of those four techniques or some combination that we saw, simple, random, systematic, um, a uh, clustered or stratified sample. Because everyone has an equal probability, we're making sure that's the case, then it's unbiased and it's representative. In other words, the sample in its internal dynamic, demographically speaking, is a kind of a mini population. So we can do uh, have our conversation with the sample, uh, do a survey with the sample, and feel reasonably certain it would be the same kind of process and dynamic and energy that we would have uh, done and felt and all of that if we'd done the population itself. Now this is important to remember, uh, the larger the sample size, the more efficient we are. The larger the sample size, the closer it gets to the population value. So as we did that exercise about um, adding samples to, until we get to our population of the class of 20. Uh, so the larger the sample, the closer it gets to the true mean, the true parameter. Uh, but in, as you can see in those theorems of chapter 6, we don't have to go that far. Um, after about 1,000 or 2,000, we get about as much efficiency as we can get uh, or, or gain for, for doing this, not as we can get, but an efficiency that's so precise that we don't get much gain any if we if we do any additional uh, numbering in our sample, in other words, go up to 5,000 or 10,000. We come ever so slightly more precise, but for a lot of money. So for 1,000 or 2,000, we can accomplish what we want and be quite comfortable with it. In fact, you can do a sample of 100 or 3 or 4 or 500, depending on what you want to do. Most samples these days are around 1,000 or 1500. That's what we do here in the community and like I said last time that's what you'll see if you look at the background when they're talking in the newspaper or on the news about sampling uh, the voting population or something with respect to some political issue that they're only sampling about a thousand fifteen hundred people out of the millions that there are who actually vote. All right so um, but we know from what we said before that coming down this is a uh, we'll draw, draw it out here again or write it out point estimate that's what that says. <laughs> if we were to draw down a one sample, we would get a mean. Cool. Uh, we're unbiased. It's representative. It's a hundred or more. So we're efficient, and it's, so it's an, a pretty precise estimate. And so we make that inference that this is what we would have found had we gone that way. But we know that if we did it one time, then that's good because we've taken care to make sure this happens. But if we did it two times, that if we drew down another sample of a hundred. That would be a hundred different people, and their, the sum of their ages might be slightly different. And then if we continue to do that, say up to a hundred samples, each one of those samples would be just the mean age for each one of those samples probably would be just slightly different than the other. So we would get a range of means from a low mean of one sample to a high mean of the other, and the other 98 samples would be somewhere in between. So, but because there are a hundred, they'll, they'll heap in a normal curve. To, uh, just like if we had a hundred X's, a hundred hundred of us, and we summed up all of our, our uh, ages, and then we did a um, divided by a hundred, we'd get a mean. All hundred X's are here, and we get a mean. So in in this hypothetical that we talked about last time, we know this is up here. We don't see it uh, because we, in order to see it, we'd have to go this way. But we know because that's over a hundred, the population is over a hundred. Its spatial distribution, the spatial characteristic or feature of its distribution, would take a normal curve. Far more heaped than the way this one looks, I'm sure. The standard deviations would be but much narrower because um, the population is so large. The larger the pop, the, po the larger of the n, the more heaped they are. The smaller the n, the more rounded are the bell curves, the flatter, if you will. Um, so as the population, or uh, the N increases, they become more heaped, more bell-like, and even more narrower in the bell shape itself. All right, so 
uh, we know that's normal and we can see that this is normal and this is the thing that we use this is what's important for chapter 7 the one is hi clearly hypothetical uh, we never see it uh, because we don't do a hundred samples we do a ma we mathematically derive them in formula which you'll see here in a few minutes um, and then um, and then use what we find there in order to um, estimate uh, what's up here and the way the way we call that is a I'll just put confidence interval like I did here it gives us a confidence interval here we have a point estimate right here and we know that there would be variability if we did a hundred samples of the same size so we need some being statisticians that we are indeed then we know then that a uh, hundred samples are going to have some variation or range in their respective uh, in the means in that group so we want ad some additional confidence and the way we do that is we construct a confidence interval so that uh, and we use this remember these are the standard errors the shape of the of this sampling distribution reflects the shape of the distribution of the sample the larger the sample size the more heap this is the larger this sample size the more heap this is up here they're standard errors down here they're standard deviations the spatial appearance feature of of a an increasing sample size with the standard errors would get smaller as this gets heaped the distance from one wall to the other would become more narrow shall we say standard errors would become smaller and this reflects this so if this is uh, heaped then this so also would be heaped whatever the shape this is we would imagine that's what the shape this is standard errors are the same thing as standard deviations standard deviations down here are the same thing as standard errors uh, formula is a little bit different but it's basically the same thing we call them standard errors here if somebody says standard error you're talking about the sampling distribution if somebody says standard deviation you're talking about the uh, distribution of the sample just a way among us uh, all of us here in the uh, community of statisticians which are all members of are we not and so that when we're having the conversation we can make that uh, distinguishing uh, characteristic we know where we are when somebody's saying standard deviation or standard error. Now, going back uh, to some of the things we've done in chapter 5 and all of that, uh, we know that uh, th if this is symmetrical, which we assume symmetry when it's over 100, 50% uh, of the distributions on the left-hand side, smaller values than the mean, 50% of the distribution on the right-hand side, larger values than the mean. This is, these are always high-end tails and low-end tails. Um, and when we think about uh, from chapter 5 we did some proportions and percentages call them B's and call them C's from appendix A in the text those those percentages or proportions you can multiply times a hundred and you get percentages what percentage lie between the first and second deviations or uh, what percentage lie between a z-score of one something or other and a z-score of another you saw how we did that another way of thinking about that is proportions Look at those proportions that are in column B and column C and don't think of them as proportions, but talk about them as probabilities. So if we get a proportion between the mean and the first standard deviation, and it says it's uh, 0.23, then we know 23 out of 100 people are going to be somewhere in this, in this. It's a probability statement if we don't say proportion. 23 out of 100 or a proportion of 23 or multiply it times 100, 23%. Uh, so we want to get stay away from proportions at this point and percentages and think of that distribution in column C and B um, as uh, probabilities. And thinking about this as a probability distribution then, so in fact is what this is. So when we look at this, then we can say, since we know from chapters 4 and 5, that 95% of the distribution lies between uh, two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below the mean. Another way of saying that is 95 out of every 100 95 out of every 100 of the values in this distribution lie between the two standard deviations below and the two standard deviations above. Um, so that's a good way to think about that. Another way to think, in fact, it's the only way to think about that right now. And what that means is, where are the other, where's the other 5 out of 100? Well, the other 5 out of 100 are distributed in the tails. Uh, there's 0 0.25, whoops, there's 0 0.025 here and 0 0.025 here. If this is 0 0.95 here, then that means 0 0.05 is what's left. And it's divided, since it's symmetrical, into over here and into over here. 
0.025 and 0.025. So in this tail, that means that about you've got about two, uh, two out of a hundred, uh, 2,500 out of a thousand, if you will, two out of a hundred or 2,500 out of uh, 25 out of a thousand, or you could round it up and say three out of a hundred are in the tail here and the tail here, but the other 95 out of 100 are most likely to be here. So if we were to say that uh, if we were to do 100 samples of the same size as the original sample, that was our point estimate, then we could say 95 out of 100 of those are going to lie between these two uh, standard deviations, or z-scores. Uh, they're, they're framed as z-scores, just like they were in Chapter 5, uh, or be because we think of z-scores as a way of using uh, Appendix A, column B and C. That's a, that's a z-distribution. Each z-score is a standard deviation, not the formal standard deviations, although they may be coincidental. We may have a z-score of minus 1, but we might have a z-score of minus 1.3, which would be somewhere down halfway here between 1 and 2. Always remember this is minus and plus. Okay, so 95, 95 out of 100. And again, um, as whether that's true, whether uh, we're talking about uh, the relative size of snowflakes, the weight of ducks, uh, the weight of us, IQ, whatever, whatever that can be framed and specified in a continuous variable, shades of color of apples, numbers of apples in an orchard, all uh, compared across all the orchards, anything that can be uh, specified as an interval ratio, 95 out of 100 apples, 95 out of 100 snowflakes, 95 out of 100 ducks, 95 out of 100 anything are going to fall between these two standard deviations, plus or minus, um, um, well, are going to fall between uh, plus or minus the mean, above or below the mean, or the mu, the mu mean in this case. So that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Now, we know that there's 68% here between these two, and there's 99% between here. Remember the, how it was framed in, I guess, chapter 5? Well, if we do that, then um, we could say uh, 68 out of 100 are here, or we could say 99 out of 100. But when we do that, we, there's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a talked about in the chapter, we're talking about alpha, which is an error. We're saying that anything inside the uh, intervals that are 95 out of 100 are similar. It's just an assumption, a declaration that statisticians make. Anything inside 95 out of 100 are similar. Anything outside are dissimilar. So if we land outside, it's an error. We'll say it that way. 99 out of 100, you say, well, uh, then that means there's very little error because you're dividing up 1%. That's all that's left. But if we do that, then there's such a range in means. Remember, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get an interval that's close to what we think that will capture that parameter up there. So if we get the net, shall we say, too narrow and only do 68%, then that 32% that's left over, there's a good chance we miss the fish in the net, the parameter. It's outside the net. The net's too small. If we use the 99%, uh, confidence interval. Then we got a very wide net, but then we got so many fish in there, uh, so many possible parameters. We don't really sure which one of those parameters is the best estimate of the parameter up here. So this would be too big a net, and we can't distinguish the parameter from all the parameters that are in there, possible parameters. This is a narrow net at 68 percent, kind of precise, but we we list, we miss a lot of possible parameters. They don't they don't we can't catch them in the net. So the compromise among uh, Consens uh, the consensus among uh, statisticians is to use the 95% probability uh, most commonly. Now you'll see 68 and you'll see 99 and a variety of others and there's a table in there that tells you about all of that and how you can look at those variabilities. But um, unless a problem asks you in a homework to do 99 or 90, uh, do always do 95 because that's what everybody always does. And it's the best size net. You've got some chance of error but not a large chance and uh, you've got a large enough net that uh, you've got a good chance of catching that parameter somewhere between the mean that represents this interval and the mean that represents this interval. Remember this is a, a, a normal curve of means from 100 means uh, it heaps because that's what the theorem says it takes a normal curve and so this then would be the interval would be somewhere between 
we think it's the mean here, but even as the point estimate, because we've made sure all this works, we're efficient, we're representative, we're unbiased, um, and all of that. We got a good sample size. We think this is good, but we know if we pull down another estimate and then another one still there'll be some variability. So we say that that variability, 95 out of 100 of those means that we did hypothetically, uh, they would vary between this mean on the low end of the interval and this mean on the high end of the interval. And that gives us the confidence interval. Gives us additional confidence that this point estimate is a reasonably good estimate. All right, so uh, that's what chapter seven is all about, estimation procedures. It's about procedures for estimating this parameter beyond just what we already have learned that we can do if we, if we get the sample size and do a point estimate, then um, we, can do, uh, we can do a confidence interval to make sure we get that little extra confidence and close, create a net, if you will, to capture that parameter with some additional uh, certainty that uh, this is the original empirical mean is a good one. Okay, I'm gonna erase this and let's look at a couple of formula. And uh, I'm going to just take all of this out because we you're keeping in mind where we are. Uh, I'm going to sit down for a minute and take a, uh, walk you through a part of the book uh, before we uh, do the um, formulas. Um, if you, you, You'll have Healy, I know. So um, here you can see on the bottom of uh, page 159, um, Well, they've got a good illustration here, I think. It, uh, again, look at figure 7.1. It tells you there, uh, page 157, 68% of all the possible means of the 100 means that we would draw down are in that uh, plus or minus 1. Uh, 95 are in plus or minus 2. 99 are in plus or minus 3. And we just talked about why generally you would take the 95%, but they talk about it in some more detail uh, later in the chapter. And then when you look at 7.3 estimation procedures, there you can see a sample size, n equals 100. It's, it's a narrow curve, uh, a symmetrical bell curve. But when you look at a sampling distribution of 1,000, you see that it's symmetrical, but it's more heaped. The larger the sample size, the more heaped becomes that bell curve. But the relationship within stays the same. 68% of the distribution in figure 7.3 is just like is within the first plus or minus standard deviation. 68% of the distribution in figure 7.2 is between plus or minus one standard deviation and etc. So it doesn't matter the shape. The principle here is that if it's uh, symmetrical, and that's what we're assuming, if it's over 100, then 68% um, uh, of the distributions plus or minus one, 95 plus or minus two, and uh, 99 plus or minus three. And here you can see on figure 7.4 what I was talking about a minute ago. There you can see the 0.025 in the tail, and if you were to add up 0.47 and 0.47, that would be column B in appendix A would be 0.475, and uh, column C would be 0.025. Uh, and if you were to look this up in column uh, in appendix A, and you can see the combined summing the two, which we did in chapter five, you sum the uh, column C on the right hand side with the I mean B on the right hand side of the column B on the left hand side of the distribution, sum them up, and that's what you get: 95 uh, out of 100, or 95 percent, if you want to say it that way. And that's the way they say it on figure 7.5: 95 percent of all possible sample outcomes. All right, there's that table 7.1 at the bottom of uh, 160. You can see 90, 95, 99, 99.9, 99.99%. .9, very small error, but a very large net. Uh, we don't have to worry about missing the fish, the parameter. We just have to worry about among all those fishes that are in the net, all those possible parameters, which one could it possibly be? Um, and at 90%, uh, it's a very narrow net. And so we have a chance of a lot of those fishes and parameters not being in there. We have a chance of not getting the true parameter. So we do the compromise consensus and do the 95, a nice size net. Reasonable assumption that we're gonna get 95 times out of 100 the parameters or fish is gonna be in there, but there's some small chance that it won't be. But we're okay with that chance. Uh, it's an efficient way of doing it and, um, and enhances our confidence. Okay, if we look at uh, page 161, 
we begin to see the formula. Now you can disregard formula 7.1. It's a theoretical formula. Let's not worry too much about it. The practice, the practical formula that you'll use is 7.2. And there you see, you see the confidence interval equals the mean. Uh, this is where we're using a, uh, a mean. There's a, one for a proportion here in a minute. Mean plus or minus a z-score. Now if we're using standard DVA, if we're using 95% um, probability, then uh, you go back over to table 7.1 and you can see that that's a plus or minus 1.96 is a z-score. Uh, in fact, you can see in figure 7.5 where it lies in that spatial distribution, uh, that shape. 1.96 closes the 95% uh, of all possible sampling outcomes and the two, uh, 0.025 are the shaded tails. So uh, we would use the 95%, so say we say confidence interval equals the mean plus or minus 1.96. And then that's times the standard deviation of your sample, which you would have. And uh, so you'd int that in the numerator, and then you take the square root of the sample size minus one. So uh, let's go over here to the next page and look at application uh, 7.1. I like Healy because they give you some good demonstrations that you can look at even though you're not in class. Here we have a case of uh, leisure activities of Americans conducted on a sample of a thousand households. Heaped, right? Uh, pretty good heaped uh, normal curve. Uh, the sample average uh, watching television every day is 6.2 hours a day. A lot of time in front of the TV. I doubt you have that much time. <laughs> I know I don't. I'm not sure that I would sit in front of the TV that long even if I did have that much time. But in any case, so the idea is from that sample is 6.2. So what they want to use that sample to see, well, what is up there in the population parameter? Just what is the average in the population for watching TV? So you see the standard deviation is 0.07. Now if we go back and you were doing this, you'd have to do chapter 3 to get the mean, and then you'd have to do chapter 4 to get the standard deviation before you got to chapter five or 7 to do the confidence interval. Everything builds on everything. Healy's giving you a break. He's doing chapter 3 for you and chapter 4 and giving you the information, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you were out there in the world, you'd have to worry about that and do all that. You'd have to construct the whole argument, statistical progressive argument, from the beginning to this point in order to pull off this uh, formula. So there you see, they use a formula, and they plug in 6.2 plus or minus 1.96 times 0.7 divided by 1,000 minus 1, and you can see how they carry that down, and they come up with a 6.2 plus or minus uh, 0 0.04, and then they do the subtraction and addition. So that means the population uh, is somewhere between, see the moo in that little frame down, still in the box uh, formula where it says the moo is somewhere between 95 times out of 100, 95 chances out of 100, the true value moo ranges between 6.16 and 6.24. And it's as simple as that. And you'll see uh, in one, uh, on page 162 that he gives you uh, another example and walks you through that one. And then as he's very good at doing, he gives you one step at a time on page 163 that one step at a time for calculating out a confidence interval for a um, for a mean. Okay, and then at the bottom of page 163 we do one for proportions uh, for large samples. We don't worry about small samples right now. Large samples. And there you can see it looks a little more complicated uh, the confidence interval equals the uh, proportion of the sample, the PS, plus or minus a Z, say it's 196, and then we got the square root of the PU minus the 1 minus PU over N. Well, we don't have the PMU, but if we did, we'd be up in the parameter and we wouldn't be going through all of this. So if you flip the page for the mystery of that, you'll see the way that we think about this is that we assume, uh, since we don't know that, that a reasonable estimate is to say uh, frame that p mu minus 1 minus p mu is 0.5 times 0.5 and you'll see that in, in application 7.2 in every case that you do this where you're doing proportions you would turn your numerator that says p mu times 1 minus p mu into 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 in other words we just assume it's at a 0.5 and figure we're not going to be off by too much by doing that alright so uh, here you can see confidence interval We've got a proportion, 45% of a random sample, 1,000, 
and um, so the proportion is 0 0.45 they backed out the, the percent now and it's 0.45 now something you want to remember if they said that it was 72 out of a thousand then you'd have to calculate out what is the propor proportion of 72 out of a thousand before you would have the uh, your sample proportion so sometimes you're given the count or frequency and not the percentage of the proportion in these problems you have to take the time to divide uh, the value they give you by in the numerator uh, for the numerator and by and divide that by the sample size in order to get the proportion for you to use keep that in mind okay so there you see uh, 0.5 times 0.5 over a thousand and they walk it down through there and they come up with a confidence interval of 0 0.45 plus or minus 0 0.03 which means that um, in the population the mu is somewhere between 0 0.45 uh, plus or minus 3 somewhere between 0.42 and 0.48 or then you could say somewhere between 42 percent and 48 uh, percent have walking as their major physical activity and that's the way it works. It's as straightforward as that. Um, and there you can see application 7.3 is another illustration of that. Um, and then he walks you through in the body of the text down at the bottom 165. You can see he's fi finishing something out there. So um, practice those and, um, and you'll be okay. I don't think I need to do any board work on that. I want to draw your attention to 7.7, um, .7, controlling the width of the uh, interval estimates. Here you'll notice um, on page 167 uh, where they've done a, a confidence interval in the second paragraph of 90 percent. You see the formula there where the z-score is 1.65 and they get a, an interval of plus or minus 14.77 and then they go down to the bottom one which is 99.9 .9, and you can see there the confidence interval is 29.45 well, the confidence interval is wide. The net is very wide. Consider the confidence interval, the, the uh, walls of the net. The net is very wide. So you're very likely to catch the parameter, but which one of those possible parameters in that net is the one you want? Maybe too wide. Uh, too small again in 90%. Walls, that interval is the wall of the net. A, a narrower net, uh, but you have a higher error alpha on the outside of uh, missing that uh, the possible parameter of interest to you may be swimming away from your net because you didn't capture it. And then you can see the one at 99% is in between. If we did, uh, I went ahead and calculated it at 1.96, which is 95, and it's 17.54. Somewhere between 14.77 and uh, 23.09. A nice size net uh, with only a, an error of five times out of a hundred of missing that uh, uh, parameter fish that uh, we're very likely to have somewhere in that range inside that net those intervals the um, the parameter of interest to us so keep that in mind and, and how you how that works now the thing that really is important here is I don't have it up here but the larger your sample size the more efficient you are the larger your sample size the narrower the standard deviations the larger the sample size the larger the standard deviations the larger the standard errors in your sampling distribution so that means that uh, the ranges in the standard devi in the in the um, sampling distribution are narrower, uh, just automatically. So think populate, uh, think sample. If I get up to a thousand, I have to worry too much about what's going to follow from that. I'm going to have a good, a nice size net, and you use 95 out of 100. And you can see table uh, 7.4 that there are um, an illustration. Uh, confidence interval for 100 is 3940, 517.55, uh, 1,012.40, 10,003.92, and you don't even have to worry about confidence intervals as sample size gets larger. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to point out on this. And um, so that's uh, chapter 7. And um, it's about 11 o'clock on Thursday morning. I'm pretty sure I'll have both these processed through. Um, uh, YouTube and posted by the end of the noon hour anyway. So um, talk to you later.